possible. Something very odd about our Fatli, never explained. The question of why we can speak. We can speak and the, and the gorilla can't speak. Why? Nothing to do with his teeth or his tongue or his lungs or anything like that. Purely to do with its conscious control of its breath. You can't even train a, a gorilla to say ah on request. The only creatures that have got conscious control of their breath are the diving animals and the diving birds. It was an absolute precondition for our being able to speak. And then again, there's the fact that we are streamlined. Try to imagine a diver diving into water, hardly makes a splash. Try to imagine a gorilla performing the same maneuver. And you can see that compared with gorilla, we are halfway to being shaped like a fish. I'm trying to suggest that for 40 odd years, this aquatic idea has been miscategorized as lunatic fringe, and it is not lunatic fringe. And the ironic thing about it is that they are not staving off the aquatic theory to protect a theory of their own, which they all agreed on and they love. There is nothing there. They're staving off the aquatic theory to protect a vacuum. No, no. <laughs> How do they react when I say these things? One very common reaction I've heard about 20 times is, but it was investigated. They conducted a serious investigation of this at the beginning when Hardy put forward his article. I don't believe it. For 35 years I've been looking for any evidence of any incident of that kind, and I've concluded that that's one of the urban myths. It's never been done. I ask people sometimes, and they say, well, of course, I like the aquatic theory. Everybody likes the aquatic theory. Of course, they don't believe it, but they like it, all I say. <laughs> Why do you think it's rubbish? They say, well, everybody I talk to says it's rubbish, and they can't all be wrong, can they? The answer to that loud and clear is yes, they can all be wrong. History is strewn with occasions when they've all got it wrong. <laughs> And if you've got a scientific problem like that, you can't solve it by holding a head count and saying, more of us say yes and say no. <laughs> Apart from that, some of the heads count more than others. Some of them have come over. There was Professor De Bias, he's come over. Daniel Dennett, he's come over. Sir David Attenborough, he's come over. Anybody else out there? Come on in, <laughs> the water's lovely. <laughs> And now we've got to look to the future. Ultimately, one of three things is going to happen. Either they will go on for the next 40 years, 50 years, 60 years. Yeah, well, we don't talk about that. Let's talk about something interesting. That would be very sad. The second thing that could happen is that some young genius will arrive and say, I've solved it. It was not the savannah. It was not the water. It was this. No sign of that happening either. I don't think there's a third option. So the third thing that might happen is a very beautiful thing. If you look back at the early years of the last century, there was a standoff and a lot of bickering and bad feeling between the believers in Mendel and the believers in Darwin. It ended with a new synthesis. Darwin's ideas and Mendel's ideas blending together. And I think the same thing will happen here. You get a new synthesis. Hardy's ideas and Darwin's ideas will be blended together and we can go forward from there and really get somewhere. That would be a beautiful thing. It would be very nice for me if it happened soon. <laughs> Because I'm older now than George Burns when he said, was when he said, at my age, I don't even buy green bananas. <laughs> <laughs> so 
if it's going to come and it's going to happen, what's holding it up? I can tell you that in three words. Academia says no. They decided in 1960 that belongs with the UFOs and the Yetis and it's not easy to change their minds. The professional journals won't touch it with a barge pole. The textbooks don't mention it. The syllabus doesn't mention even the fact that we're naked, let alone for, look for a reason to it. Horizon, which takes its cue from the academics, won't touch it with a barge pole. So we never hear the case put for it, except in jocular references to people on the lunatic fringe. I don't know quite where this diktat comes from. Somebody up there is issuing the commandment, thou shalt not believe in the quadratic theory. And if you hope to make progress in this profession and you do believe it, you better keep it to yourself because it will get in your way. So I get the impression that some parts of the scientific established are sort of morphing into a kind of priesthood. But you know, that makes me feel good because Richard Dawkins has told us how to treat a priesthood. <laughs> he says, firstly, you've got to refuse to give it all the excessive awe and reverence that it's been trained to receive. Right, I'll go ahead with that. And secondly, he says, and you must never be afraid to rock the boat. I'll go along with that too. Thank you very much. <laughs>